other than the Bible, what are the oldest words that you know? Right? We the people to form a more perfect union. Right? We, we, we know the, those words, right? What are words older than that, though? What are the oldest words you know? Right? The oldest words I know are the Apostles' Creed. They go back to the second century, and I can't, can't think of anything I know that's older. The, uh, the, the legend behind the, the, the creation of the Apostles' Creed is on the day of Pentecost, as the disciples were getting together that night, that each one of them said one phrase, and there are 12 phrases to the Apostles' Creed, and there are 12 apostles, and yay! That's not actually what happened, though. It's a great legend. But what actually happened was the church at Rome had a problem in the second century, and the problem went something like this. The disciples could teach people to follow Jesus in the same way that Jesus had taught them. Walk with me. Heal. Serve. Listen. Chat. Let's see what happens, right? It's a very apprenticeship sort of intern sort of model. Follow and do what I do. Well, that works for a while. That works till probably end of the first century. But you get into the second century and A, the disciples are gone. And B, at a place like Rome, there are a lot of people joining the church. And it takes a lot of time to do it that way. And you've got to make sure nothing slips through the cracks. And so how do you make sure no one like, slips through the cra cracks? And, and how do you make sure everyone has the right starting place? And so what they put together is the Apostles' Creed. It is the, the starting place for following Jesus and everything else that, that goes along with being Christian. So the Apostles' Creed is rooted in this idea, this response that I uh, as you are baptized, you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you're going to follow Jesus and accept the gift of salvation, this is how we need to think about it. I will invite you to pay, turn to page 35 in your hymnal. Because this is still part of how we do baptisms. Right? So the middle part of the baptismal covenant on page 35, the pastor addresses all. Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scripture of the Old and the New Testament. And the pastor says, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the response is, yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. You're starting to recognize the wording there. Right? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, etc. And so the way that you become part of the family, accept the gift of forgiveness and salvation, is you use the Apostles' Creed. This is our starting place. And it continues to be essential to us each and every time we gather around the table as a, as a people. If you flip over to page 9, you're going to find it flip baked in there too. And page 9, the great thanksgiving, the way that we gather around the table, uh, the first thing that the pastor says at length, it is a right and good and joy, joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That should sound familiar. And it goes on a bit, and as we talk about the gift of creation, then the people respond, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. And then next, holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. And we'll go through that for a bit. And then the, on the next page, uh, the, the people respond, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And the third part of this is, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the way we, do bap be the way we begin in baptism and the way we continue in communion is using the way the Apostles' Creed lays it out. If you're going to think about God, this is how we do it. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> uh, baptism is rooted in this. Communion is rooted in it. And so the Apostles' Creed becomes a way of thinking that's baked into how we understand who God is. We're, and these words are powerful words that bind us to our church, that bind us to tradition. And saying them can be amazingly powerful words that shape how we think and how we understand. But I've got to confess to you, and maybe you have as well, you ever start saying the Apostles' Creed and you sort of check out for a bit? Yep, you know it. I, I've done it before. If you've ever looked up here during the middle of a prayer or, or during the middle of the Apostles' Creed, and I don't look like I'm giving it my full attention, all I can say is, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> they are, not only are there words that we sometimes get distracted while saying, sometimes we struggle with the words themselves. Because the Apostles' Creed has some things in there that we might struggle with. It says, uh, the Holy Catholic Church, that tends to be the one that catches people's eyes most often. Catholic means universal there. That's not a commitment to Pope Francis, cool guy that he is, but this is a saying, I believe in the church as a whole across the entire world. We're not making a, a, a commitment to any particular denomination. So there are words that we might struggle with. Do I believe in this part or that part? And, and it's okay to struggle with it because, frankly, it's not your creed. It's not my creed either. Right, if it was my creed, if I was the one putting together the Apostles' Creed, I would add a few lines. I would add something about how Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who served and healed all who came to him. Wouldn't it be nice to add? I think it'd be great to add that. I think it's important to note that Jesus healed and served all who came to him. But it's not my creed. It's the church's creed. And so we say it as part of the church that is committed to following Jesus. And then this is the part, this is the part where we begin then to unpack everything else that, that the creed leads to. It's the starting place. The creed has been misunderstood at times. It has either been rejected as some sort of power play, trying to tell me what to think and what to believe, and can't I just read the Bible by myself? Well, no, it's not trying to tell you what to think or believe. It's a starting place. It's, it's a beginning for a whole lot of discussions. On the other extreme, sometimes the creed has been used as a litmus test. If you don't agree with everything in here exactly as it's written, you're, you're not in, you're out. Again. The creed is not laying out a specific theory of sin or of salvation. It's saying, this is what we believe. Now let's talk about it. There are 1,189 chapters of Scripture and over 31,000 verses. There's plenty to chew on, disagree with, and chat about. The creed is where we begin to make sure we, don't, we start well. We don't miss the basics. And so we're going to look at the creed for this week and the next two weeks. And we're going to start where the creed starts. I believe in. Right? Those, that's what we say. I believe in God the Father Almighty. And now to say I believe, what do we mean by I believe? I believe the Royals will go to the World Series. Can I say that with any certainty? No, I really can't, can I? <laughs> I believe, so if I say I believe, then that's kind of, maybe, that's kind of aspirational belief. I believe that my friend Brian is going to come over for dinner. I've been trying to get my friend Brian over for dinner for months now, the entirety of the year. He's a pastor, I'm a pastor, it just really hasn't worked out. So when I say I believe that Brian's going to show up for dinner, it probably will happen before the end of 2018, but we've tried about four times thus far, and I'll believe it when I see it. That's not quite the belief that we're talking about here either, is it? How about another type of belief? If I say, I believe that the best government is a small government, or I believe that government has a role in solving the problems of, of communities that make up the government, right? those are two different beliefs, and they will shape what I do, they will shape how I vote, they will shape how I act, but that's belief that. And that's not what this creed says. I don't believe that God is Father Almighty. So what? I believe that the sky is blue. What does the creed say? I believe in. Right? I believe in. And that word matters. The word in. Because I believe in my dad. I believe if I called my dad right now and I said, Dad, I got a problem. Can we chew on it? He would take the time and we'd chew on it. I believe in my mom. If I call my mom and I say, I have this really weird cut of meat to figure out how to cook, she'd say, Andy, that's interesting. Let's figure that out. I believe in my wife who will smile when I walk in the door. I believe in you that you will be here and we will worship together on a Sunday morning and it will be good. I believe in. That's a statement. I believe in God the Father Almighty. That, that's a relational thing, isn't it? I believe in God the Father Almighty. I don't just believe that, that there is some God out there. I believe in this God the, God the Father Almighty. It's a statement of trust. I trust that you will be here on a Sunday morning. I trust God will be Father. Now to say that I believe in God the Father Almighty, Father Almighty, you've got to put Father and Almighty next to each other because the concept of Father in 2nd century Rome, this might be one of the harder parts to understand about the creed because when it says Father, this is not like go oh, jump in the guy's lap and cuddle up with Dad type of Father. Father is a paterfamilias. It's the head of the household. 
father is the one who is the, like the mini dictator. He is in charge. And so if you are 18 and you are under a, a father and that father decides that you're not of eight, doesn't matter how old you are, you're not an adult now, you're not. And if your father doesn't think you're an adult when you're 28, you're not. Or 38. You are an adult when I tell you you're an adult, right? That, that, that is the type of dad that's going on here. This is the father almighty, the man in charge, right? That's kind of how the, the, the emphasis on this, right? So this is the one in charge. And so when Jesus says in Matthew 23, you have one father, it's making it very clear that there is one person in charge. It's not Caesar. It's not anyone else in Rome. The person in charge here is God the Father Almighty. That's who's in charge. Now, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And we've got to hold heaven and earth together, both, them both being good. Because if you're, if you're just all about heaven, and, and that's where we're heading, and it'll be good, and this earth is something to leave behind, well, that's called Gnosticism. That's disparaging the goodness of what God has made. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh. It's heaven and earth. And if you only focus on earth and you only focus on what you can touch, it's only real if you can touch it, well, then you're ignoring the... There are things that are real in this world that we cannot touch. I cannot touch forgiveness, but I can't live without it. Right? So we have to... God created all that is, that is, all that is seen and unseen, heaven and earth. And so how do we live this? How do we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and how does that impact what we say? First, it strikes me that if we all say we believe in God, their Father Almighty, what's that make us? Siblings, right? Now, if you're part of a family together, can anyone ever say, well, that's their problem? You ever hear that phrase? Oh, that's their problem. Can you say that about something that happens in the church? Right? That doesn't work, does it? We're all in the church together. We're all in the body of Christ. We're all in this together. And so let's talk about the body imagery for a second. If, if, a, if a body has a problem, let's say you have a body, and that body's kidney is not working quite as well as it ought, and it's not doing a good job of stripping the uric acid out of the blood. Right? Whose problem is that? If the kidney isn't functioning right, where does it show up first if the uric acid starts to build up? Dale? Big toe. Big toe, yes. So, Andy finds himself calling Dr. Esmeyer on f last Friday office saying, I'm having severe big toe pain. Words I'd never put together in my life, and it was frankly hard to say, because I have a kidney problem, right? I have a kidney, I have gout. I'm 37. The fact that my kidney has a problem, my toe can't say, well, that's your problem. No. It's all hooked in together. And so if you see a hitch in my giddy up in the next couple days, that's why, because I am having severe toe pain. So embarrassing. In the same way, I can't say I have a problem, and you can't say, well, that's your problem, right? If you have a problem, you know what that is? That's our problem. We're the church, body of Christ. We all say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. That means we're in this together. And if nothing else, we can stop, we can listen, we can drink some coffee, though in my case it'll have to be decaf, uh, and we can pray with each other. If you've got a problem, we have a problem. Let's sit down and chew, chew on it together. That's part of what it means when I say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Now, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is a gift. And to this day, I remember a moment when I did not receive a gift well. When I was in college, my parents paid for my brother and I. We went up to see a show in Chicago. And uh, you see a show in Chicago, you say the word ticket, that costs you 50 bucks right there. And then it's a decent show and you get decent seats. And then you gotta pay for parking, and you gotta pay for gas, and you gotta eat something. All right, this, is, this was an expensive evening. And my parents paid for us to go and, and go to this show. The show was blast. It was an amazing show and I could try to explain it, but it sounds really kind of foolish. So go look it up online if you're interested on YouTube. It's an amazing musical performance. And I had seen it once before, and I thought there was like a sequel to it. I was seeing the sequel, and I wasn't. And as we left that night, I didn't say thank you. I was not appreciative. I, I just, <sighs> there is, 
very few things harder than giving someone a gift and it not being appreciated or, or accepted and, and handled well. I called my mom this week and I told my mom, you know, I, I felt shame over this for years. And do I remember this correctly? And she said, yeah, you do. Oh, good, right? <laughs> Was I a bum? Yes, son, you were a bum. Uh, and I am thankful that she showed me grace and not beat me upside the back of the head back then. But she said, you know, that was part of growing up for you. You didn't say thank you. You did not express appreciation. You didn't express excitement either. I was never excited. I was never thankful. I really was a punk. And uh, I appreciate her grace because I mishandled a gift that, she, that her and my dad gave me. And we receive this gift that God gives us, right? And to show thankfulness... Is there any one way to show thankfulness all at once? You really can't. I've been racking my brains about this, right? There's no way for me to be thankful to my parents all at once for all that they've done for me. The way we show thankfulness is in a bunch of small acts. You say thank you again, and whenever you need to say thank you, you say thank you. And I hope everyone here has heard me say thank you to you often. I hope I am an appreciative and thankful person now, and this is part of why I am. I realize what a punk I was back then. And I think to receive the heavens and the earth as a gift, there's no way that we can say thank you all at once to God for that. What we can do is say thank you daily as a way of life, as a way of living. And so I don't use disposable dishes. I say thank you. I will treat creation well. I'll do the dishes. And I do them, right? I turn off lights, recycle, I pay attention to the issues around treating creation well because it is a gift that our Father has given us. And the only thing I can do when I'm given such a great gift is that all the heavens and the earth is to treat it as well as I can every day. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Those are the oldest words we might know. Hopefully they are our words, and we're going to confess them together in mere moments. But let me remind you that even if you are not paying as much attention to them every time you say it, you're going to pay attention to them this time because we just talked about them at length. But every time you say them, even if you're not like completely keyed in, it still helps. It still matters. It is the way that we begin our discussions together. What do we believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. We begin in the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Now please stand.